Now, I've just had a look on my phone. Right now, my phone can pick up five Wi-Fi points. Yay! I stand a chance being able to access my emails. Nearly all of us have a mobile phone that connects to the World Wide Web, transmitting data from all around the world into one big receiver that we put up to our heads. But do you ever wonder what these rays swirling around us are doing to our brains and our health? Six years ago, Dr Erica Mallory Blythe moved to the country, stopped carrying a mobile phone and sacrificed a successful career in emergency medicine to focus on a new medical interest, radiation emitted by Wi-Fi, mobiles and other wireless devices. She is now one of the country's few professional advisors on medical conditions related to radio frequency, RF, radiation and other electromagnetic fields. And I'm delighted to say uh, she joins me on the line. Good morning. Good morning. Thank Good morning. You. You've researched this. Um, there has been much debate. I've done many a, an interview um, with other uh, academics, physicists and so on who've looked into this. On a scale of 1 to 10, how convinced are you that Wi-Fi, mobiles and other wireless devices may be harmful to our health? 10. 10? I've got no hesitation in saying that at all, um, especially with your wording, harmful. There's tens of thousands of research papers now dating back to the 1950s that show effects at a cellular level and then up through the systems, which which can reasonably be expected to be harmful. So I feel I feel confident in saying that, and I'm not alone. And um, the timing of this is good because three days ago, 190 scientists um, from 39 different nations appealed to the UN member state um, and the WHO to take this issue more seriously, asking for more protective safety limits more stringent guide, um, guidelines and protection for children and pregnant women, amongst uh, many others that can be found online. I did a, a, an interview a while back, actually, with a physicist from the University of Warwick, a Dr Gerald Highland, and he said at the time that low-intensity radiation from the phones, these are known, and I'm sure you'll correct me if I've got this wrong, uh, non-thermal radiation changes the structure of human cells. In fact, he went as far as to say that if mobile phones were a type of food, they simply wouldn't be, be licensed because there's so much uncertainty surrounding their safety. I agree with him, absolutely. So why is it, says me gayfully in the introduction, oh, I can, I can get five Wi-Fi points up on my mobile phone and then I stick them to my head. In your view, what do you feel that that's doing to my brain? Well, uh, it depends which level you look at that on, really, whether you look at the cellular level or in terms of symptoms and, and sort of the systemic level. But at the cellular level, we found loads of different effects, too many to really talk about on the radio, but um, everything from damage to DNA, and it was the link with glioma, so that's um, a type of brain tumour that unfortunately has a really terrible prognosis. The link with cell phone use and glioma is what led to it being categorised by the International Agency for Research on Cancer as a group 2B or possible human carcinogen or cancer-inducing agent. And unfortunately, the type of radiation emitted by mobile phones and Wi-Fi routers and baby monitors, etc., cetera, um, is linked to the, the, uh, the, we've used something called the Hill Criteria for Causality in the scientific world to try and determine does X cause Y. And it does satisfy those criteria for causality for both glioma and another type of brain tumour called acoustic neuroma, which is benign but still can be very serious. You know, you know as well as I do, there'd be, be so many people listening to this programme who've probably used their mobile phone today. They've probably sent their children off to school with a mobile phone tucked in their, in their school bag. Children are particularly... Um, uh, susceptible, uh, and I go back to Dr. Gerald Highland, he was saying it's particularly dangerous for children because their immune systems are not fully developed. Does any government in the world advise against having these signals around children? Absolutely. Um, I'm very happy to say that the French government have banned Wi-Fi in schools for children under three and restricted use of it for children under six. And obviously it's common sense that nothing magical happens to children at these ages. And our own government does caution against use of cell phones for under 16s, stating clearly that they shouldn't be using mobile phones except for essential calls. 
and uh, I, I'm pleased that they've done that, but obviously that, that advice really should be extrapolated to mm. all people. Children are certainly more vulnerable. And another thing that really concerns me is given that kind of action and warning, we shouldn't be advocating use of other radio frequency devices without using the same caution. And uh, tablets, for example, can actually have an equivalent or even higher in some cases specific absorption rate for that kind of radiation. Stay with me because um, I want to come back to this point of, of children and, and I want you to listen to this because one parent who's taken this very seriously is Paul Lewis. He took his daughter Jessica out of school as she was complaining of being unwell. Take a listen. She went back after the summer holidays one particular year and um, the first few weeks that she was back at school we noticed that she was on one particular day but she was getting quite severe headaches and um, she was eight years old at the time and she you know pretty much had, had no energy she looked wiped out completely white so she'd come home and she looked just washed out yeah and... yeah washed out when when her mum picked her up from school she was washed out and, and complaining of a really bad pain in the head which must be so i mean it's worrying for any parent when their children come home and go i'm not feeling very well or you yeah. look at them and you think they're washed out and yeah. and I, I suppose the last thing that you thought was that it might be wi-fi that's the problem you actually didn't even know the school had Wi-Fi at the time. No, I didn't, we didn't know the school had Wi-Fi. We didn't know I had any health issues regarding Wi-Fi at that time. So you didn't think the school had it. You took it to the doctor. Yeah. What did the doctor think? In, initially, the um, eye test which we had in her eyesight was fine. Mm. Um, and then the only other thing that they suggested at the time was to give her painkillers, um, mm. which didn't think that was great, really, because we could find out what was the cause of it. And there were particular days of the week where she felt worse than others. Yeah, it was. I mean, I know that we know the reason now, but at the time we didn't know the reason, but it was particularly on a Monday. Mondays were bad days. Now, most people yeah, say, well, Mondays are not good yeah. days. But what was it with, high, with as, as facts emerged, yeah. that turned out that Monday was such a bad day for uh, her? Well, Monday in that particular class, the Monday afternoons, they pretended to use the laptop computers. Uh, most of the class were using them at least an hour. Uh, and so that was... Well, we know later that was that was the reason why it was Monday that were particularly bad. And she was sitting quite near the router. She was, yeah. At first, yeah, she was sitting um, quite near the router, which was near um, the um, teacher's desk. So here you had your daughter Jessica. She's at school. Monday's a particularly bad day. She's sitting by the Wi-Fi. Suddenly, do the pieces of the jigsaw start to fall into place? We didn't know um, at that time that, that about the Wi-Fi. It's only now that I know. But um, I think at some point I was searching for children and headaches. It came up on the internet, a number of children that had similar symptoms to Jessica when, when Wi-Fi had been installed in their school. So not long after that, there was um, an event at school and, and, and I was there and I noticed that they had Wi-Fi routers. So then I started thinking, well, that, that could be the, the cause of the, of the headaches, severe headaches. And you firmly believe that is the case because I think your GP uh, eventually backed up your suspicions about Wi-Fi being the probable cause of Jessica's headaches. Yeah, later on there was, there's quite a bit of correspondence between the school and, and, and I and um, one of his um, uh, GP did agree to write, me a, write a letter to the school saying that in his opinion the, the Wi-Fi microwave radiation was the probable cause of Jessica's headaches. Having said that, the school, I know, pointed out that there had been a government report. It had advised that Wi-Fi exposures were well within internationally accepted standards. Are you absolutely convinced that your daughter's fatigue, the rashes that she got on her legs, looking washed out, were directly as a result of being close within the Wi-Fi range? Well, it's very difficult to be 100% certain about anything. Um, but the only time she had the headaches was that particular, the severe headaches was that particular day. And um, when she was at, at weekends, she didn't have, never suffer from them. In holidays, she never suffered from them. And on other days at school, she wasn't particularly unwell. It was that particular day. So, so you, you think the evidence is, is pretty clear. Well, having, well. having said that, um, Paul, you, you were so convinced about this, you actually offered to pay for the school building to be wired with cables rather than have Wi-Fi. Well, yes, when I found out that, about the Wi-Fi causing headaches in children, well, I offered at first for us to do a survey to measure the amount of microwave radiation they were giving off, but they didn't take me up on that. No. Um, and then I later offered, you know, that I could probably pay for the school to be hardwired, thinking 
funny about Jessica, but her brother and sister that would probably attend that school and other children as well. That was Paul Lewis talking to me earlier. Jessica, I should point out, is now homeschooled and has no symptoms. So what's the official guidance on Wi-Fi radiation? This is the government's line. There is no consistent evidence to date that exposure to radio signals from Wi-Fi and WLANs adversely affects the health of the general population. The signals are very low power in both computer and the router and the results so far show exposures are well within the internationally accepted guidelines from the International Commission on Non-Ionising Radiation Protection. On the basis of the published studies and those carried out in-house, Public Health England sees no reason why Wi-Fi should not continue to be used in schools and other places. Well, still with us is Dr Erica Mallory-Blythe. Um, what's your reaction to that statement from the government? I'm disappointed, really. I think it's a level of reassurance that is not justified by the literature. And I mentioned earlier that there are tens of thousands of studies. 70% of those, or thereabouts, show evidence of harm. And that's specifically when you look at independent studies. Um, and thankfully, that's still the majority. If you look at industry-funded literature, you see a different picture. But we should only be looking at independent studies, and 70% of them show harm. And there's an excellent online resource for people who want to take a look at some of those studies. wi schoolsorguk has a list of studies that show harm well below guideline levels and from use of devices such as Wi-Fi. It was a very interesting point that when I was chatting with Paul earlier this morning, he was also saying that the, the, the standard of, you know, possibility of radiation and so on was, was done where they were saying it was safe, but it was done on somebody who weighed 200 pounds, was male and six foot two, which, of course, no child is going to be like that. That's correct. He's referring to um, SAM, Standard Anthropomorphic Mannequin, and SAM represented the 90th percentile of military recruits. And that was the, the testing um, structure that was used for the initial testing of cell phones. So they weren't tested, certainly for use by a child, but actually not even by a woman or an average man. What would you say, especially to parents who are listening to us this morning and they're, they're listening to this conversation, they've heard what Paul has had to say, what would you say to them? Would you be saying, don't give your child a, a mobile phone? I think mobile phones should be for emergencies only and never carried on the body of a child or even an adult when they are active. And in fact, you'll, you'll find similar advice in the manual that comes with your cell phone. So no you... adult should have it on their body is what you're telling me? No, that's right. There's, um, in, in the device manuals for all of these devices, there are cautions about the distance at which you should keep it from your body. And but hang says, on a minute, we all stick mobile phones to our ears. Absolutely, and um, if you read the guidance and the document that comes with it, it will say it should be no closer than, for example, 15 millimetres. And th th that guidance varies from device to device. It's sometimes more than that, which is often incompatible with use in, in somewhere like a noisy, busy place where you press it right to your head. So, no, I, I don't think children or adults should be carrying phones which are active. What would you say to somebody listening to this and they go, oh, come on, you know, you're, you're scaremongering, you know, phones have been around for quite some time now, nobody's fallen, fallen, you know, massive numbers have fallen off their perch as a result, you're just scaremongering. I think there's, you know, there's a big difference between scaremongering and giving honest advice that is reflective of the literature. And I feel that we fail to do that many times in the past with things like smoking and asbestos for example and we need to learn from those lessons it's not fair to the public to not allow them to make an informed consent and so i my role really as i see it is not to tell people not to use their phones it's to tell them to read the literature or at least read some independent summaries and um, that website that I mentioned gives some independent summaries but it is hard to find because unfortunately the enormous revenue generated by this industry has touched so many different advice giving agencies. Two final very brief points. Would you give a mobile phone to a child? Uh, not uh, only for emergencies and not to be carried active so in, in flight mode that's the best piece of advice I feel I can give is Use flight mode, aeroplane mode. It disables the various different radio frequency emissions, but you can quickly and easily turn it off and use the phone if you need to for an emergency. And do you have a mobile phone? 
only for emergencies and it's stored in flight mode in the car. Dr Erica Mallory-Bly, thank you very much indeed and I'm sure that's given you plenty of food for thought this morning. If you